Hey everybody, JD here. Thanks for joining us on episode number two of Fish with JD TV and uh, hope this finds you well. It's uh, day, what, 429,817 of quarantine, I believe. Uh, yeah, whew. it's kind of crazy times, isn't it? Hope you guys are all well. Um, things are getting funky out here in California. I'm sure they are where you are too. Uh, we're having lots of boat ramp closures. Um, so I haven't been fishing at all. I canceled, I started canceling fishing trips about, uh, three weeks ago and I was supposed to really be hot and heavy into my striper season right now and uh, not doing that. So, uh, I've been sitting around the house quite a bit and, uh, um, that's, that's kind of it really. I wish I had some uh, cool fishing stories to tell you, but I don't, but we have, uh, the good news is we have a great guest tonight, Scott, the sporting chef, Laysath, who is the country's, maybe the world's foremost, uh, wild game chef. He's the host of, uh, the sporting chef TV and, uh, one of my favorite shows, dead meat. And, uh, I'll show you a little clip of that in a second, but, um, yeah, I just, ah, gosh, hope every, everybody's doing all right. Um, my buddies in Washington are telling me that uh, the entire state is closed down to recreational fishing. And I think we're not too far behind that here in uh, California as well. Like I say, ramps are closing, parks are closing. It's it's hard to get out. And I guess as a fishing guide in the, in the future, that might be okay for me because people are going to be so pent up, they're going to want to go fishing if they have any money left. But that's a whole other story. So anyway, um, I got to thinking about how I'm um, getting down to the kind of the end of my uh, salmon at the from Alaska at the bottom of my freezer, some halibut and stuff. And I thought, well, who better to ask what to do with that stuff than my buddy Scott Laysath. So uh, if you haven't tuned in on the Sportsman channel and watched his shows, you got to check them out. I'll give you a little sample here uh, of dead meat. It's, 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 it's a hot show. I'm Scott Laysath, hunter, fisherman, and professional chef. If you can catch it, trap it, or shoot it... I can cook it, and I've cooked it all, or so I thought. This is my journey to hunt down and cook the wild, weird, and hopefully edible. Look out, critters, you're about to become dead meat. <laughs> well, there he is. JD! How you doing, Scott? Uh, you know, I'm good. Um, and you know you've been on the dead meat show yourself and uh i, I have is that aired yet i'm sure that we won a grammy or an emmy or something <laughs> <laughs> you mean that wasn't life-changing for you um, being on the show no no <laughs> i mean however it was, it was however, cool it's cool it is my favorite show though right off the bat and i appreciate that you know we were shad fishing and of course most shad's not known as being one of your better eating fish no, right not not so much so, so you connected me with Jay for Jay, who was the chef at the firehouse right. in in Old Sacramento. He since yep. talk about timing. Jay yeah. has just opened a restaurant um, up in Sun Valley, Idaho. Um, yeah. Which, right? Knowing him, will be fantastically successful once this crud goes away. Once the crud goes if, away, if he can make it like the rest of us through it. But so. you know, the, the shad being so bony, Jay showed me how to how to. Fillet the shad, if you can believe that. And it's really just kind of small pieces of boneless fish. We did a show. Um, we did the Asian carp show. So, you know, the carp that go flying out of the water and right. in the back right. of the head. And yep. it's exactly like that, by the way. It's just like the YouTube videos you see where fish are flying out and hitting people fun. in the back of the head. And they're wearing football helmets yeah. and all that. So. And you know how you know, carp, the guy with a bow and all that. Right. And by the way, it's not a real good percentage shot because you're going around in hard circles <laughs> in a boat, standing on a platform, shooting arrows at fish flying out of the water. Hopefully without a boat next to you. <laughs> we, well, we had three guys constantly shooting arrows for about three hours. And we got three fish. All the other ones jumped into the boat. And they they really, they're, you've got 20-pound carp hitting you in the back of the head. But what I learned about it is that we took it to a guy, um, Dirk Fusick, in Chicago. And he took the carp, and he just took the skin off, left the bones in, took yeah. out some of the bloodline, and then ground the whole thing. Now, why right. some of the bloodline? <laughs> if you're, you're going to do well, it, 
Go full Monty, I would think. You know, and I would, but you know, the Asian carp, they're filter feeders. They're not bottom feeders. They're not, they're not eating crud. And it was kind of weird when you when you open them up, they've got this kind of olive drab green slime on the inside of them. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds good, right? Yeah. But and then you rinse that off. And so he just ground the whole thing, bones and all. And the bones, there it's just calcium, right? So sure. I want to do the same thing with Shad. So we need to go out again. Shad will be coming up next month. We need yeah. to go out. I want to take this and do the same thing because the Shad have those little feathery little bones in there. Yeah, they just dissolve away if you... And and nobody wants to eat Shad for the most part because they're such a pain to clean. Yeah. Don't, don't clean them. Run them through a grinder. And then he made he made uh, carp meatballs. He made carp burgers carp i know what sounds better than a carp cake right <laughs> well i, I guess i'm not gonna tell you try it but uh I, I gotta admit it doesn't sound super appealing but it tasted great and the yeah. shad themselves the shad are good tasting fish if you can get past the bones yeah. we're gonna grind it we're gonna do that me and you okay. me and right. we're gonna do that all right i'm in uh that that means we get to go fishing, which I, I I'm I'm in. We, we might have to sneak out. Yeah, um, and then we got to do the squawfish one too, and and I'll be curious if we can find anybody uh, to cook said squawfish, but uh, or pike minnow, excuse me, right? I'll call them pike minnow, but um, I've talked to a few people who have um, attempted to eat them, and I mean they're they're edible, of course, and and maybe the same thing is true. You mash them up into a ball and put a lot of ketchup or whatever in there and right because they're lean and they're lean and bony too right so yeah. have you and i've found that most people that go squawfish i wouldn't eat a squawfish have never eaten a squawfish right have you have not have not and i, I, I had, <laughs> right i had a guy on my boat one year not a squawfish but a sucker fish and he catches it and he's gonna unhook it himself and i said ooh, ooh hold that out over the side of the boat don't drip any of that in there those things are terrible Right, and, and he said, "Oh, are they no good to eat?" And I was like, "Oh God, I mean, no, I, I would never." Uh -huh. And sure. he said, "Well, have you actually eaten one?" I was like, "No, uh, no." But <laughs> but my defense was that everything that is tasty in this world, we humans have figured out and hunted or fished to the brink of extinction, and there's plenty of suckers, so therefore they can't taste that good. Okay. I went sucker gigging in Missouri for the dead meat show. Of course you did. <laughs> we did beaver trapping and sucker gigging. So the opening, I know, I know it sounds really good. So on the opening night of sucker gigging season in Missouri, there's, there's hundreds of, yes, there's hundreds of boat out on these flat rivers. Okay. You've, you've got a, what looks like a frog gig, only it's about twice as long, big spotlights, and you're just going along gigging suckers. <laughs> And then after you gig them, they just basically throw them into a barrel. And after we've had enough moonshine, ah. then they've got this thing that looks like a waffle iron that's got all these little blades on it. And you score the sucker and then deep fry them. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> hey. But here's the thing. I mean, I could deep fry my uh, my flip flop and probably make it taste good. It right? would taste pretty good. Well, and I asked these same people in Missouri. I said, "Do you do you ever?" use like a dipping sauce or anything like that. And they said, no, why would I want to ruin a perfectly good carp? I mean, a perfectly good sucker. And I'm thinking, of course. I, I, I can think of a couple of different reasons. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can eat sucker. Um, and so, and but getting back to those fish cakes mm. with, with, the, um, with the Asian carp, uh, with the shad, it tastes like any other fish cake you've ever had. And and fish cakes are generally pretty good. So find any crab cake recipe, fish cake recipe, grab a carp, stick it in your grinder, and go to town. Those are that's my advice. Okay, well, uh, duly noted. Duly uh, noted. So uh, besides grinding up fish, uh, junk fish, uh, what what have you been doing on the compound during the uh, quarantine? Anything exciting? Uh, you know, every now and then I have to put my regular clothes on to make sure I can still fit into them because um, <laughs> I've been walking around and pajamas and shorts most of the time as a matter of fact what you wearing jd well 
<laughs> Wait a minute. Uh-oh. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my wife was totally, totally uh, offended by my mixing of plaids. I think you're not supposed to do that till after Labor Day or something. I don't know. Yeah, but, I'm not even wearing pants. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I I, uh, I took a couple pictures of things I've been doing. I've, I've had a pretty exciting week, actually. And so um, I was going to show you here. Let's see if I can make this work. Um, uh, be prepared to be pretty impressed here. So uh, <laughs> this is one thing I've been doing. Uh-huh. Uh, pretty exciting. That is. Well, it's a good thing you moved up the hill, right? That was yeah, timely. Yeah. And uh, I guess we have... Uh, have more of this coming this weekend so that that won't be the only uh time i shovel a boat out <laughs> and then uh let's see what else we got here oh it's on a loop i don't know why it's looping but well then you can run up to the ski area and go skiing then you this weekend can't you oh, oh yeah oh, if, wait. I, if oh, wait. I wanted to walk up the hill can't um, do that either are yeah. people doing that there i mean i've heard that people are carrying their skis up amazing then, amount of people and, yeah, and then just kind of cross countrying down the way they do. It's so. it's crazy. You, you go to over to like Heavenly, and you look straight up the hill, and there's tracks as far as you can see. Now the smart guys we saw the other day had the uh, snowmobiles and went up. <laughs> God, I got to make a million dollars this month, you know, with the uh, towing people up in the snowmobiles. Yeah, right? you Until know, it, it snowed here. Um, you know, we had a, a terrible winter here in Tahoe, and then it snowed. And then the resort's closed. So, um, yeah. But the uh, the other thing I've been doing, um, I, I took my jet boat, uh, the one that I should be putting four to six guys in every day, every right. every day this month. It's um, just money. It's just money. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. You, you can't take it with you. No. Um, it, it does help pay the mortgage. So, ah. but uh, I went, uh, went. Hitched it up, which was kind of new and exciting since I haven't been out in you know three weeks already. Backed it into the river and put some fuel stabilizer in it. So that was <laughs> pretty fun. That's and, just like that's like fishing. Yeah, yeah. And then I uh, took apart a uh, a carburetor for an outboard because it was there. And and that that was pretty much sums up my week. So, um, but what I did do was uh, you know we've been cooking a lot here at home. Obviously, we haven't been anywhere. And I was, uh, you know, I, I always keep a bunch of salmon when I go to Alaska and guide in Alaska and bring bring some back. And we're getting kind of down to the dregs. Um, you know, we I do it pretty good too. I mean, I when I I don't let anybody mess with my salmon up there. I mean, I hand select them, I catch them. I only keep bucks because they, you know, they have uh, firmer meat and all that. And then I, you know, on ice bleed them, all the stuff. I mean, I, I take really good care of my fish. And then skin them, pat them dry, put them in cellophane, and then vacuum seal them. So they they last quite a long time that way. But now that it's been closing in on a year, some of that stuff's getting a little, you know, funky. So I thought, uh, who better than you to ask what to do with that? Well, and fish generally doesn't get better with age. (laughs) <laughs> right? I mean, it's not like unlike us. Not, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. What a lot of people have in their freezers is too old fish. I mean, you know, they've got this trout that they caught in the Sierras six years ago, and they keep moving it around their freezer. Right. And really, it's time. The, the whole um, one is wrapped in uh, aluminum foil. Aluminum, <laughs> aluminum foil, and it's it's mostly freezer burnt. Mm-hmm. I want you to go ahead. I'm giving you permission. To throw that away or use it for catfish bait or something because Find it's, it in the garden. There's a re yeah, bury it under a tree somewhere and and you can get you can it'll it'll it, that'll help right. Yeah. Um, one of the things when you've got some of that fish in the freezer, you'll notice that when you you know you dry it, you wrap it in cellophane, you vacuum seal it, you do all the right things, and then when you go to thaw it, you have this bag of fish juice in there, right? Yeah. Where's yeah. that fish juice coming from? I know. So the first thing you want to do is you want to get rid of that. So mm. any kind of fish that you've thawed, even if you have fresh fish, I keep it wrapped in two ply paper towels. And the reason why I say two ply is if you use cheap paper towels, it just sticks to the fish. It's not absorbent, not absorbent. And what you want to do is you want to wick all of that funky fish juice out of the fish. So that way, when you've got your salmon, um, 
it's going and when you let's say if you go to put your salmon on the grill or you want to baste it with something now it's going to absorb whatever flavors you add to it instead of competing with these funky salmon juices right so keep it wrapped in paper towels it'll last longer it'll taste fresher and if the paper towels happen to get moist you want to rewrap it again with new paper towels keep it dry 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 so with that salmon first thing i do is if it's if it's an older piece of fish whether it's a salmon or a halibut or whatever i'm going to take a little piece out I'm going to put it into a skillet and see how it behaves. If it tastes bad, I'm not going to eat it. I've actually had people that have called me and said, man, I've had this tuna in my refrigerator for a couple of weeks, and it's really starting to smell bad. Mm -hmm. What should I do? <laughs> well, <laughs> Don't soak it in buttermilk, because <laughs> yeah. all that's going to do is ruin your buttermilk. <laughs> if your fish smells bad, there's a reason why it smells bad, and you probably shouldn't eat it. That's fair enough, right? Right, right, exactly. Don't don't eat green meat or fish that smells bad. Are two of my steadfast rules. Yeah, those words to live by. And and, and uh, people when uh, people say, "Oh, I don't like fish; it tastes fishy." I'm like, "Fish isn't supposed to taste fishy." No. If your fish tastes fishy, uh, yeah, do what you said. Put it under the tree. So if you're, if so, you're and if your game is gamey, the same thing. You've done something wrong. You know, when people, you know, I, obviously I cook a lot of wild game and people say, I don't know, how do you get past that gamey, livery, muttony thing? And I'm going, mine doesn't taste like that. My fish doesn't taste fishy and my game doesn't taste gamey. And if it does before I get to work on it, well, I'm just not going to eat it. Yeah, um, I'm with you. Now, hang on one second. We got a, we got a slew of questions here. Let's uh, let's see what we got going here. Um um <laughs> well our uh, our buddy jay is checking in boom there's a, there's jay oh look at jay. that boy he's a oh. handsome fellow isn't he we better oh, yeah. get him off the screen he's gonna make us look bad Jay's uh, a mess. Uh, <laughs> so do you you know senior tuna steve carson yep uh, yep he's uh he's saying tmi on the uh the carp <laughs> <laughs> uh Let's see. Uh, oh, oh, wait Jay. a minute. No, where did Jay go? There he is. There he is. He he, he said uh, it's hard to keep him lit, too. Uh -huh. Yes, it <laughs> is. Uh, Matt Myers says he'll get us some pike minnow. Um, that's nice of him. Matt, um, you want to cook him for us? <laughs> and then uh, I, I think we're going to all believe this. Um, Brian Ricucci, Big Daddy, says everything's better with whiskey. And uh <laughs> <laughs> I'm a uh, vodka man myself. But, yeah, uh, uh, sure. I thought we, oh, oh, and, and Ricucci also says this: thumbs down to carp cakes. What? But I guarantee he's never tried them. You've never had carp cakes. See, you're you're making my point. People that say I don't eat coots, I don't eat spoonies, I don't eat whatever. Most of the time, they've never tried it. That's people right. that say that snow goose, they snow geese, they call them sky carp. I serve people snow geese all the time. I just don't tell them until after, and they go, wow, that's really oh, good. Oh, uh, uh, uh. Right. Um, hey, we actually have a real question. Oh, Steve Carson says, TMI, <laughs> it wasn't the carp, it was the PJs. <laughs> <laughs> not not the fact that you don't have pants on. He didn't seem to mind that. Well, uh, I'm not standing so, up. So Red Jeep, I've got almost a two-year-old vacuum sealed quick froze halibut that can, has been kept frozen. What do you think? Should be fine. If it's not... Halibut cakes. <laughs> yeah. If it's yellow and it smells fishy, maybe not. <laughs> it's not. Take the halibut out and make sure you get all that funky halibut juice out of it. And what I do with those paper towels, I press it and get as much of that juice out as I can. And worst case scenario, that halibut, as long as it doesn't smell bad, would be great for chowder. Um you know, the last thing you're going to add is the halibut, by the way, when you're making chowder, because otherwise it just disintegrates oh. and, you, and you and you got nothing. But chowders, you can make uh, halibut cakes out of it, press all the junk out of it, use your favorite crab cake recipe. What I like to do with that, if you butterfly a big shrimp, dust it with flour, leave the tail on, and then build your fish cake around that butterflied mm -hmm. butterflied shrimp and then it just looks like a big shrimp cake with a tail sticking out and they go wow that's really good shrimp cake and then after you're done you say oh no that's that's carp that's carp <laughs> perfectly good uh shrimp gone to waste <laughs> uh, um uh well, oh so as far as a chowder i've made some chowders just you know looking on online whatever right um 
Is there a kind of a quick, basic uh, chowder base you could throw at us here? Because I, I might be doing some of that soon with the salmon. You know, the easiest thing to do is just to make a roux, do a little butter and flour, make a roux, build something and put milk or half and half on top, whisk it in. You can put a little fish stock. If you've been paying attention, if you've been following JD's advice and making fish stock out of your light colored fish, um, it's really, it takes about maybe a half hour, 45 minutes to make fish stock. You can add that to it too, or put a little chicken stock in there. I use onion, celery, garlic, maybe some diced carrots. And you're just gonna let that simmer. You're gonna let all the flavors meld. It's for a quick, quick chowder. It's really easy to do. The last thing you're gonna add is the fish. And you could put, and let's say you've got random pieces of fish in your freezer. You've got half a pound of halibut, a little salmon. You know, you've got some, some delicious uh, squaw fish or pike minnow that you have in there. <laughs> and you wanna add that to it, you can make a mixed fish chowder. And what's cool about it, you make a big batch of it. And during these times when people aren't getting out all that much, why not bring a big pot of fish chowder over to your neighbors, leave it on the doorstep, You know, let them know there's some fish chowder on the doorstep. It's better than a flaming bag of anything yep. and ringing the doorbell. Let's share with our neighbors, right? Yep. Now is a good time where, I'll bet you if you bring some fish chowder over to your neighbors, next time they're doing something, they might want to make a little bit extra for you. And that's one yeah. less trip to the grocery store. Absolutely. You know, I'm kind of hoping that something good comes out of this mess where maybe we're a little nicer to our neighbors. <laughs> you know, they uh, they don't yeah. talk to me a whole lot, but there's yeah. probably a good reason for that. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Well, let's see. Oh, we got another question here. And um, let me see if I can. Uh, uh handle this one for you uh fishing the north coast kenny priest i believe that would be uh asks what feet uh what fish freezes best and i would say uh the colder ones right the colder <laughs> ones <laughs> sorry the uh, that was bad the more delicate fish in general don't freeze well you know i don't trout i don't think freezes all that well the the those fish you have up there in lake tahoe the the mackinaw I think they're best eaten fresh, fresh, fresh. Keep them cold, keep them fresh. Um, for the for the saltwater guys, for the inshore guys, even the speckled trout, mm -hmm. same kind of same kind of thing. They don't seem to freeze well. Any of the more delicate fish, to me, I eat them fresh or I don't eat them. Yeah, and and stuff like halibut. I always think of kind of like the white fishes. Seem like they freeze better. Maybe they're just less oily or something. It just kind of depends on on the firmness to start with you know the the delicate fish to me once you thaw them you know they kind of disintegrate it's funny uh people love salmon and i and i do love i like salmon i don't love i mean i love to catch them but um to eat them uh raw uh, I, I would eat salmon raw every day over cooked salmon um, me too um, i get i get salmon out yeah, it's 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 so rich, I guess, is what the deal is. Um, but uh, you know, it's still good. But people go crazy for it. You know that uh, I guess maybe people that don't uh, don't get to fish as much as we do for certain. But well, uh, have you have you made grab locks? Have you made like you know, you, know I, you had brought that up to me several years ago, and I never did it. But I love <laughs> grab lock. You know, my wife's Jewish, so. Um, I never had lox cream cheese and bagels until I got into that side of the family. And, right. uh, and you know, you buy a little thing of lox about that big and it's uh, $79. <laughs> and so uh, if I recall, your grab lox is really pretty easy, isn't it? Equal parts, coarse salt and brown sugar. Yeah. Um, you put a layer on the bottom of a, of a container. I use, I just have a plastic tub. Um, and then you put your salmon filet on top, put another layer of the salt sugar on top of that. If you want, you can use fresh herbs, that kind of thing. But it's basically, it's gonna, you're gonna be curing it with sugar and salt. Um, twice a day, uh, well, sorry, first of all, once you get it in there, you wanna put something on top of it. I have a really thin board that I have wrapped in foil that sets on top of the fish. I put bricks on top of that. You can use coffee cans, but you want, wait, 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 because you want to press all the 
the, the liquid out of the salmon. That's the whole idea. You're just drawing the liquid out. So twice a day, you pour off the liquid, you flip the thing over in three days. Normally that's on the third day. That's when I'm going to put fresh dill, fresh herbs, maybe a little couple of slices of lemon and lime on there, press it back down. It's cured in three days. In three days, you slice it thinly, just like you do the stuff you buy in the store. It tastes the same. It's really, really super, super simple to make. And all it really requires is sugar and salt. No kidding. That's no uh, kidding. That uh, seems like a much more economical way to go about it. Um, well, it is. Unless you consider that, you know, uh, going and catching a fish, uh, sport fishing wise, costs about a billion dollars per pound. But, yeah, but, it, but, but it's, it's your fun. fish and you caught it on that trip with JD. Right. That he that he made so special. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so uh, what else? Uh, um, you got any? Uh, let's see. I talked to somebody the other day, and they were getting down to the. I think it was the end of the venison, and and they were kind of wondering if stew or something. Um, stews are great. You know, those of us who hunt and fish normally have more in our freezer than other people do. Mm -hmm. um, Jay for Jay, who was just here. Um, I'll bet he has a really loaded freezer, especially now that he's up in Idaho. Um, if only he could get out. Jay, were you able to shoot a turkey? I, I need to know that. Um, so if you've got a if you've got a little bit of venison, let's say you're down to a little venison, you've got some elk, you've got some duck, you can make a mixed game stew um, that's really, really simple. And let's say you've got a bunch of ducks, whole ducks in there. I never cook a whole duck. Um, that now is a really good time to break those ducks down. You make stock out of the bodies um, on the bigger ducks on the mallard and pintail. You want to braise those until they're they almost fall off the bone. Then you can take the breast and make stew. You can make soup. Um, you can make chili. You can grind all of that wild game together. I like if I've got venison, if I've got elk, if I've got duck, and I've got some random pieces. I'm going to grind it with some cut up pork shoulder. That has about the right amount of fat for me. And any, any recipe that you have for ground meat, you can use that for. You can make burgers, meatballs, meatloaf. Um, you can you can leave it, leave it whole muscle and go low and slow and do kind of a pulled pork preparation. All of that works. You've got stuff in your freezer that you may not know about, but now is a really good time to clean out your freezer, hmm. get organized, because when we can go back out again, my plan is to fill my freezer back up. I'm good until about September, I think. Late September, we might be eating frog legs. <laughs> tastes just like chicken, I hear. Well, no, it tastes more like iguana. Ah, yes, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, we got a couple, uh, we, we got past the salmon guys here. So uh, bait fisherman or fisher person, uh, asking uh, what uh, what kind of salmon do you prefer or is there a is there a uh, one that stands out you know i prefer sockeye over king in general anyway but that's just yeah. a personal preference it's got to be fresh for me i'm not typically going to use a frozen salmon certainly not a one-year-old salmon to make grab locks um i prefer to get a good a good fresh salmon for that so uh, whether it's sockeye or king it's whatever you have access to that's the freshest yeah, that's the uh, that fresh is always good. Um, I, you know, I, I like sockeye. I think just for barbecuing better too. Um, the the fillets aren't you know you get a king in the fillet sometimes right. that thick and it's it's a Cajun blackened on the outside and uh, a sashimi on the inside. So um, I, I I often bring a lot of uh, sockeye home from Alaska. But and you know and and speaking of blackened by the way, blackened isn't blackened anymore. So oh. when you say when you say blackened, um, when I go to a restaurant and they say, "Would you like it? Would you like it blackened or grilled?" and I'll go, "Tell me about blackened." <laughs> well, we put a blackened seasoning on it. That's not blackened. Uh. The whole reason, the whole thing behind what Paul Prudhomme did the blackened redfish many years ago, you're burning spices onto the outside of that fish. It needs to be black is blackened. It gets that good carcinogenic crust on the outside of it, mm. as opposed to just some blackening seasoning on the outside. When I, the way to really blacken a piece of fish, and salmon's a really good candidate for that because it has a high oil content, you rub blackening seasoning, and that's going to have 
um, uh, cayenne pepper, black pepper, white pepper, salt, uh, seasoning, um, and you rub it on the outside, you get a, a white hot cast iron skillet. Leave it on there full blast for a half hour and you're going to sear, you're going to burn those spices onto the outside. That's blackening to me. I'm sorry. What, what were you talking about? <laughs> well, that, that to me sounds like something you might do. I mean, do redfish not taste good? Is that why they blacken redfish? Well, we just cooked the snot out of it. And we, 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 I think redfish are back now, obviously, but you don't see them on menus anymore. You know, with, when it became so popular, mm -hmm. um, everybody ate redfish and then they disappeared. Kind of like um, uh, Chilean sea bass, which, as you know, is a fancy Patagonian term. toothfish. Yes, Patagonian toothfish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody in the marketing department said, uh, "No, no, ain't nobody going to eat a toothfish." <laughs> oh, no, sir. So yeah. uh, what we had uh, Kenny back. He had a smoked salmon recipe or a recipe question. You have any uh, any insight there? I'm sure you do. I brine it. Same brine, I brine everything else with. I, you know, one of my favorites I use is a high mountain brine. Um, and it has a little sodium nitrite in it, but don't be scared. It's better. Um, if you don't have access to the high mountain stuff, uh, a gallon of water, cup each, kosher salt, brown sugar, leave it in there overnight, pat it dry. Before I smoke it, I put it on a rack in my refrigerator and let it air dry for about a half hour or so. You want to get that little pellicle, that little glaze on the outside. I smoke it at about 185 to 200 degrees. Um, if you want to go, if you want to go hotter and just get smoke flavor and get a hot little crust on it outside, crank it up to 250. Hit it maybe 300 right at the end. Um, I like my smoked salmon a little underdone, and that shouldn't surprise anybody that's followed me. I like most of my stuff underdone rather than overdone, and I just noticed. I sure have a lot of junk in the back on that mirror. Um, <laughs> if we do this again, I'm going to clean up behind me, I think, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you need a fancy green screen. I, like I do. I need one of those. Yeah. Whatever that is. Uh, yeah, that's, I don't know. Uh, Jay says something. Oh, he has not got a turkey yet. Uh, <laughs> Jay, I'm going out Tuesday. Come on down. Yeah, wear your mask. We, we had about three dozen gobbling the, on uh, Wednesday morning. And I managed to scratch one out and um, came home without the virus. So I'm good. Well done. Yep. Uh, we got more questions, so let's keep going. Uh, you got a recommendation on vacuum sealer. Don't buy the cheapest vacuum sealer. Um, they don't work. They don't hold I up. Time. You want to spend about 150 to 200 bucks, whether it's a food saver. Uh, Weston makes a good one. I'm a big food saver fan, always have been. Um, their game saver line is going away. So here's a hot tip. Go to the food saver website um, and go and, and get a game saver. The game saver big game unit that was around 200 bucks. I think it's, it's way down now. Um, and there's lots of coupons and all that kind of stuff. Um, I use, I've had the Game Saver Big Game and I've used it a lot and it's kept up just fine. But I've also had the cheaper ones that don't keep up. Do not buy a hundred dollar vacuum sealer. It's not going to work. Um, a real hot tip for those that are freezing fish or freezing duck breasts or anything. And this seems to be kind of a, a an eye opener for a lot of people. You know, whenever you're vacuum sealing, uh -huh. you're hoping that it seals before the juice goes into the chamber and keeps it from sealing, right? right. You're going, and you go, come on, come on, come on. Freeze it first. Take your fillets, your duck breasts or whatever, put it on a sheet pan, stick it in the freezer. Once they're frozen, then you vacuum seal them. And that gives you a really super, super tight seal. And you don't get all that juice going into the chamber. You know, makes, like moist makes, makes, makes sense. Because a lot of people take paper towels, right? And they put it in there. And But even when you do the moist button, still, you're, you're, you're still sweating it. Yeah. Freeze it first. It'll be the tightest vacuum seal you've ever had. Yes. And, and um, I'm sure you were, uh, you've probably been aware of this, but that uh, that doing the saran wrap on your uh, your meat before vacuum sealing it, I learned right. that in Alaska. And man, that has changed. Uh, that's been a game changer. Now, I may be ingesting all sorts of, uh, you know, 
DuPont chemicals. Uh, but, uh, you've you've had worse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I've, I've cured salmon eggs and sodium sulfite and all that crap for so long. Right, right. But um, uh, that that really that second layer seems to really uh, really increase the um, the suction. I don't know the the ceiling. It does. It does. Um, but I, I but I've really yet to find a better way than just freezing it first. Yeah. And, and it's funny you say that. I'd never thought of that with, with food, but we do that when we cure a, a skein of salmon eggs. Right. Yeah. Cure it, freeze it, and then vacuum seal it. And then you don't have all the, the mush factor too. And you don't have to freeze it for a day or two. You just want to get it nice and cold so that it's not going to have all that juice leaking right. out. Now, uh, this is not a question, but how cool is this? This is our buddy Roberto from Chile, who we went and uh, spent some time with a couple years ago, me and Bob Spar saying howdy from Chile. So that's cool. Roberto, thanks for checking in. Hope to see you next year, my friend. Hope you guys are safe down there. I haven't heard too much about uh, the the bug down in Chile. So maybe that's where we got to be going. Um, okay. This one's going to be tough um, because Julie is a phenomenal chef so you're gonna have to pull out your best stuff here and uh you got any albacore recipe yeah i've, I've got i mean albacore is a really versatile fish mm -hmm. um i don't like to do a whole lot to albacore um i don't i, I still want it to taste like albacore right um so i'm gonna little olive oil salt and pepper slap it on a grill i'm gonna do maybe like a chimichurri that's got bright flavors to it. Most people lean towards spicy flavors, more like a like like they do with a with an ahi tuna. Um but I love albacore and I get a little ahi out. I think California is the ahi tuna state because mm -hmm. um that seems to be what we eat the most of but very often I'll get ahi out just I get I get salmon out and I love a good uh, albacore. Um, the biggest mistake that she knows that you can do with albacore is to cook it too long. So, uh, and you know, we all know people that say, well, I don't like raw fish, but they'll eat a seared rare tuna, <laughs> which, of, which of course is raw in the center. Right. And, you, and you'll point that out to them and they go, yeah, but it's different. It's just different. And it's whatever. It's your food. You're eating it. I don't care. <laughs> exactly. Um yeah, when I was uh, steelhead fishing this winter, um, I was staying up there with Julie and Fred. You know, you know, Big Fred. I don't know that Big you Fred. You met Julie yet? I don't know, but I don't think so. Um, you would be as a uh, the pro that you are for an amateur um, chef. She's amazing, and uh, the the albacore that I had there this this uh, last uh, last month was well, it was raw, so it was good. Yay! Um, right. So, um, so what else, what else, uh, could people do this time? Uh, you know, while we're sitting here, any other, um, uh, delicious, uh, and got anything for squirrel, nutria, <laughs> lizard, you know, we were at the world champion squirrel, um, cook off in Bentonville, Arkansas last September. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I had all kinds of squirrel and it wasn't all good. Um, but young squirrels, you can do whatever you want to with a young squirrel. You can cut them up, quarter them, fry them. Older squirrels are best cooked low and slow. Um, with any animal, the tougher parts or the tougher animals are best cooked low and slow. You braise them. Um, it's gonna it's gonna break it down until so that it's a tender piece of meat. If you take an old squirrel and you just throw it in a skillet, it's gonna be really tough and chewy. Mm. But if instead, if you brown it and braise it, and let's say you take your squirrels and you put it into a roasting pan, put a little wine in there, some celery, carrot, onion, cover it up, go low temp until that squirrel almost just kind of falls apart. And then you can make a pan sauce out of the liquid that's in the pan. Um, to me, that's a good tasting squirrel. Um, you know, a lot of people, what they do with their, with their waterfowl and their upland game birds is they breast them out and they throw the, everything else away. To me, that's wanton waste. There's so much good food on there. If you take duck legs, and I wait, during the duck season, I wait until I have enough duck legs to make an appetizer. I'm going to brown those mallard legs, 
Then I'm going to throw them into the same kind of braising pan until they almost fall off the bone, and then I'll cool them. And then when I'm throwing the duck breasts on the grill or in a skillet, I'm going to add those duck legs to it. And people marvel at how tender they are and how they fall right off the bone. Uh, the same thing with pheasants, wild turkeys, the wild turkeys that are out there right now. If you just breast them out and throw the rest away, you're just an idiot. Because <laughs> those legs, if you can braise them, and the bottom section on those legs, you could you can cook for three or four hours and still beat somebody over the head with it. But they're going to make great stock. If you roast that whole wild turkey body and you don't need to pluck them because the skin on a wild turkey, there's not a whole lot to it. There's not a lot of fat in there. But if you so just peel the whole thing, take the breasts off. You can butterfly those. You can do whatever you want to with the breasts. That's the easy part. Just don't overcook them. But take that carcass, whether you've got, let, let's say in your freezer, you've got whole pheasants, you've got um, you've got a wild turkey, a whole wild turkey. Take everything apart, brown and braise, or brown and 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 make stock out of the bodies, the legs, the thighs. Use the whole animal. When you've got your fish, when you break that halibut down, make stock out of the bones and out of the head. And you know, same thing with the stripers. It makes great stock. I don't make stock out of salmon because I don't think it tastes good, but. Very often, we don't use enough of the of the resources from the fishing game that we bring home. That was the long answer. I don't even know what the question was. <laughs> well, it was a, <laughs> and I, I get that uh, a fair amount on the boat um, when I'm flaying uh, fish for people. Uh, Filipinos in particular love to make fish stock. It seems like every time I get Filipinos on the boat, they're like, hey, give us the whole thing. I'm like, that's awesome. Take right. Take and uh, a lot of Japanese too. That that you know, I remember I was flaying fish and threw a fin and and uh, <laughs> what? My, client, my client's girlfriend who didn't speak any English said something in Japanese and she's yelling at me and he's like, oh, uh, JD, can you uh, not? Oh, okay, sorry. And I, you know, I get into a habit of just chucking over the side and right, right, oh, not the tail, not the <laughs> like. Okay, sorry, maybe we'll just. Do you want just the whole fish then? <laughs> but, uh, <I> mean, <laughs> well, that's yeah. better for you, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's great. And you're using everything. I mean, that's that's kind of the whole point of harvesting, right? So speaking of, uh, uh, we were on waterfowl there for a second. Got another question here. Uh, what's your best recipe for specs? Well, and for those of us that are in Northern California, it's been a banner couple of spec years. Um, I don't know why specs taste so much better than any other goose. Um, I, uh, I'm going to take for the spec breast. One of my favorite things to do, because I, I still want it to taste like, taste like spec. And very often with a lot of our waterfowl recipes, like the poppers that everybody eats with the bacon, jalapeno, cream cheese, they taste really good. But the reason why I like, I think a lot of people like them is because they don't taste like duck or <laughs> goose. Um, with the specs, I don't. I, it, much like the albacore, I'm not going to do a whole lot to it. Um, I'm going to. I like to butterfly it. Maybe put a little prosciutto, fresh basil in there, maybe a little bit of cheese, wrap the whole thing up, um, kind of roll it up like a burrito, put it seam side down in a skillet and brown it, put a little, a big splash of wine in there, maybe a little balsamic vinegar, put it into the oven until it's just done on the inside. I want about 130, 135 degree internal temperature. Let it rest for a few minutes, slice it into medallions. It's so, so good. And you don't really need to do a whole lot to it. Sounds really good. You know, um, after all this, I'm so inspired. I'm going to go uh, get some. Put some pants on. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, optional. But uh, go get some of those frozen burritos. Or I think they're chimichangas, I think, uh, out of the freezer and, and have a real nice meal. And, and, and <laughs> you know, this evening. Um, yeah. So this is, a, I don't know if you even want to go here, but. Uh, our man, John McManus from uh, Golden State Salmon Association, wants to get a little deeper here. And uh, where did you learn all of this? From one of your cookbooks, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. You know, I, I, I was in the restaurant business for a long time. I was, when I was, when I, right when I got out of school with my degree in psychology, um, I went into the bar business. And hey, that's a good uh, book, actually. Uh, bar restaurant business and i was vice president of a 33 unit chain had my own restaurant for years catering business for years 
I would, when I was in high school, my parents would make the mistake of going out of town for a week or so, mm. and I would have people over and I'd feed them. Um, cooking has always been a thing for me. My mother taught art at the Smithsonian. So there's the creative side of my DNA strand, apparently, that, um, you know, foods, it's kind of a creative thing. I, one of the things I don't try and do, I don't try and out chef anybody. I don't try and find the most obscure ingredients to make whatever. My whole goal, many, many years ago, I found people would say, man, I love the duck hunt, but I don't want to do it anymore because I didn't want to eat duck. And I'm saying, don't blame the duck. It's <laughs> a lot simpler than you think. People, would, I found that people would try and do anything they can to make game not taste like game. So, and that what they would do is just make it taste more, not less gamey. Actually, it, it's it's so very simple. If you treat the animals properly in the field, when you're on the water, and then you make sure when you when you come home and you put it up, you do the same thing. It's going to taste great. But my passion for cooking has been one of the things when I had my own restaurant. Um, I didn't want the chef to be able to say, "Well, <laughs> I'm out of here <laughs> on a Friday night if you don't do what I'm saying." I'll go, and I'd like to be able to say. I'm going to miss you. It's time to go. Um, so I can, you know, it would be really hard for me to hop in, hop behind the line right now because I'm a little out of practice and I'd probably just get in the way. But I could get back to it eventually. But, you know, you got to know your limitations. Being a TV chef is infinitely different than being a real chef on like Jay because every day he's got to deal with it. If you don't know what goes on in the kitchen, it's it's not Gordon Ramsay cussing at everybody. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into it. The margins are super thin. If you don't pay attention, you're going to go broke. Um, and so, you know, there are real chefs and then there are TV chefs. I'm now a TV chef, um, which is a lot easier. But I really, 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 really love showing other people just how good fish and game can taste and that, it's it's a lot simpler than they think. Yeah, that's cool. It sounds like uh, your your sort of theme is uh, a little undercooked and a little under seasoned. Uh, uh, let the let the wildness uh, come out. So it sounds right. like I had to right. sort of put you in a box. Yep, but, yep. Uh, it's I, again. I want people to appreciate the fishing game they bring home, and I love it when I go back to a, let's say a consumer show on the other side of the country every year. And people come up and they say, I don't give my ducks away anymore. To <laughs> me, that's that's the victory. Absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. Well, speaking of uh, all that, uh, maybe we should leave these fine folks wanting a little more and uh, disappear into the night, into the ether. Uh, we need to do this again. Uh, I'm... <laughs> my, all right. Well, yeah, we'll look. Out. Yeah. Uh, or my fish, formerly bottle of wine thing. But... Uh, no, it's been awesome. So if people would like to learn more, uh, the sportingchef.com, correct? Sportingchef.com. The first and second quarter, uh, the Sporting Chef TV show is on Sportsman Channel, and that's just your basic fishing game. I've got some great people, including Jay, that contribute to the show. Um, second half of the year is the Dead Meat show. Um, I'll tell you all about, on the next time we talk, I'll tell you all about the pigs we shot with AR-15s out of golf carts in Texas. Oh, I was so hoping you said, we're going to say helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this was the poor man's redneck hunt. We couldn't afford helicopters. We were in golf carts on a golf course at night awesome. with silence, silencers and AR-15s and night vision and thermal scopes. That's like a dream comes true right there. That's not something you see on every TV show. Oh, and that, that in all seriousness, is why that show is so cool. I mean, just... You know, frog gigging or uh, sucker gigging, nutria, whatever, and uh, shooting pigs out of golf carts. Right. Seriously, folks, uh, you'll be entertained if, if nothing else. You, you may be horrified at what he finds that's somewhat edible. The you can uh, always turn, turn the channel. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So, uh, and uh, you got uh, your Facebook uh, page. Facebook, right? Sporting Chef, go there, Sporting of. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. If you go to the Sporting Chef YouTube channel, I have a blog on Winchester. Um, and I'm on the cooking editor for the Ducks Unlimited magazine also. If you're a waterfowler, 
um, I just finished tweaking an article that I'm doing for July because it was all about a wild game, the ultimate wild game feast. Have your friends over and have a big, wait a minute. Can we do that now? <laughs> so Perfect. have your friends over or or not. We'll, we'll cook with Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and then uh, you have an Instagram page too, which is oh, awesome. yeah, I, that too. Yeah, I, I know you don't handle any of that stuff. So how we? <laughs> I thought, well, I handle some of it. He's got a he's got a gal who does that. Uh, he's 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 a uh, he's big time. That's big pimping when you got a you got a gal. Ah, so, uh, yeah, she's yeah. she's a she's a good one too. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, thanks so much for coming on. This has been fun, and uh, as if you had anything <laughs> better. <laughs> um, we will uh, maybe we'll do this again tomorrow. I don't know. So um, uh, we got to go get some more shad so I can grind yeah. them up. Shad, and uh, we'll go get some pike minnow too, and uh, all the good stuff. So, uh, and folks, thanks for tuning in to uh, listen to a couple of board fishing and hunting people do nothing, sitting in their home in their pajamas or otherwise. Um, and don't forget, you can uh, subscribe. I don't know where the button is, somewhere over here, over there. I don't know. Subscribe to Fish with JD YouTube and all that stuff you said too. Instagram, Facebook, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, uh, you guys have a good week. It's the weekend, right? I can't even remember. It's like the twilight zone. I don't even know what it all is. runs. It all runs together. So uh, uh, we will uh, catch up to you. I don't know. Sometime soon, Scott. And We'll uh, do it again. And I appreciate all the people that stuck with us. Yeah, that's kind of amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh yeah well enjoy the uh the time at home with at the compound and uh we'll uh, we'll talk soon back at you see you man see ya <laughs>